So our next speaker is uh, the revered Dr. Lowry, who uh, informed me today he's now been here for a few decades uh, longer than uh, Dr. Zogby. Uh, and uh, he's going to uh, share with us uh, his thoughts about repairing the mitral valve and current surgical approaches to preservation. Dr. Lowry. Well, thank you very much. These have been great talks. And uh, we'll move on now to the uh, surgical side of things. Um, so this has been the result of a team effort here for a number of years trying to sort out the problems associated with the repair of the mitral valve. And it's been a very pleasurable association uh, over time with many different people. And we appreciate that. Um, well, in 1969, Dr. Carpentier uh, introduced his uh, famous uh, quadratic resection, which involves uh, removing the area affected by leaflet caudal rupture, uh, taking out a square section, and then stitching it up, and then putting a rigid uh, D-shaped ring sized off the anterior leaflet in to remodel the annulus. This immediately became the standard technique worldwide, uh, and it's still the most commonly applied technique worldwide throughout all the different nations uh, who report data. And it's also become apparent with the passage of time over these last uh, 40 years that this technique has a low repairability rate, poor long-term durability, uh, significant instance of systolic anterior motion, which is a very difficult problem to deal with, and more recently, uh, Post-op exercise studies have shown a significant incidence of clinically significant mitral stenosis with this technique. The repair rate in the United States uh, from the STS database is currently 62%. So you've got a one in three chance if you make a random selection of surgeon that you will be getting a patient back with a prosthetic valve. Uh, this assumes even greater significance when we look at Dr. Enrico Serrano's recent publication in circulation of a population of people with prolapse treated either by repair or replacement in a number of institutions internationally, demonstrating a 20%, 20% survival deficit at 10 years if they got a replacement instead of a repair. As Bill said, we're dealing with a very complex, dynamic uh, thing. It's not just a couple of flaps we're dealing with. We're dealing with the left atrium, the leaflets, the annulus, the cordy, papillary muscles, left ventricle, and importantly, actually, uh, the aortic root motion is a critical component in the uh, function of the mitral valve. And you can see here the relationship between the aortic root here, the left coronary sinus, the non-coronary sinus, the aortic mitral continuity, and the attachment of the uh, left atrium here, which makes it look like we've got a D-shaped leaflet here. But when we go to our uh, uh, annular tracking software, we can see that this whole area, here, even above the level of the attachment of the left atrium, is all one big membrane. And the importance of this membrane is this is the posterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract. And in systole, this has to be allowed to bulge back into the left atrium. So anything you do to restrict motion across here is going to cause problems. The uh, left ventricle is uh, beautifully set up for smooth flow of blood through it, uh, aortic valve, mitral valve. Uh, first thing to note is all the mitral apparatus is in the posterior half of the left ventricle. And the uh, posterior leaflet here forms the posterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract. By definition, it starts at the lower edge of the uh, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. The aortic mitral, mitral angle is critical for normal function of the mitral valve. It's normally about 118 to 120 degrees, gets a little steeper during systole. That's so that the flow of blood can be directed towards the uh, apex in diastole from the left atrium and can be directed from the apex towards the aorta in systole. So this angle here changes. We know that as the heart gets uh, smaller, as systole advances here, the uh, Mitral annulus descends towards the apex and the uh, leaflets get applied to each other more, than, more and more. So we get what's called a zone of apposition or coaptation, which is maximal at peak systole. That's had a very important role in uh, essentially a Roman arch effect where these leaflets become dependent upon each other and uh, compression together rather than the cordy to maintain their position. And you can see that in this mathematical simulation where we look at stress down here at the bottom as we go across, 
And as the leaflets get more and more opposed and the annulus gets smaller, the stress gets transmitted as the uh, apposition increases, the coaptation increases, the stress gets transmitted initially to the strut cordy and then eventually to the annulus where the peak pressure on the ventricle is uh, dealt with out in the strongest part of the apparatus. This is what happens when we get a, a flail segment, this flail anterior leaflet. We've got a dilated annulus that's flattened and we can see that the brown is high stress and this anterior leaf is under a tremendous amount of stress. Here we see a normal valve and the stress levels are normally very low because of this uh, contraction of the annulus by 25% and the apposition of the leaflets. If we do something uh, like Dr. Carpentier recommends, and that is to cut out leaflet tissue, which makes the leaflet flatter and puts it under tension, and put an annuloplasty ring that is rigid and flat, we flatten out the normal shape of the annulus and we end up with an extremely highly stressed uh, type of repair. And Dr. Carpentier himself uh, published a paper on causes of uh, failure, and the vast majority of them were related to things tearing apart because of the high stress left on all the tissues of the repair. The natural uh, valve, which is big and floppy and has a three-dimensional annulus, as we've talked about, these mechanisms produce a situation where there's almost no stress on the leaflets. The uh, mitral annulus is a three-dimensional structure, very dynamic. In diastole, it's got this saddle shape. And then in systole, what we see is this steepening of the saddle, so the anterior part rises up and is pushed towards the posterior part, which also rises a little bit, and it folds across here like this. It folds up. The anterior part folds towards the posterior part. And what we're seeing is a motion here mediated by the aortic root. This point here corresponds to this point here between the left coronary and non-coronary sinus. The aortic root expands by 12% as the heart contracts and the aorta rotates over, kicking that uh, sinus part back towards the left atrium, into the left atrium. We can see this on CTA where we can see here in systole the aortic roots expanded by 12 to 14 millimeters and is pushing back the anterior portion of the mitral annulus. And then in diastole, uh, the opposite, the aorta is getting smaller and the left atrium, uh, uh, the, the anterior portion of the mitral annulus is getting bigger, as, which is what you'd want. And here we have some nice human footage from Siemens, and you can see this uh, rocking motion of the aorta, so it in systole, it's more horizontal, and that uh, aortic annulus is kicked back into the left atrium, and you can see this compression of the anterior part of the mitral annulus here, pushing the anterior leaflet into the posterior leaflet, and of course the mitral annulus is 25% smaller at this point also. Here, 3D... Uh, uh, here's an MRI, left atrium, aorta, left ventricle, and you can see here how the correct motion of the anterior leaflet allows in systole the whole heart to get smaller except for the left ventricular outflow tract here which is expanding. So this normal backward motion and upward rotary motion here mediated by the aorta and the left atrium and the aortic mitral continuity leads to expansion of the left ventricular outflow tract during systole. Vortex flow is a critical part of normal mitral valve function also. Here we can see the mitral valve, apex of the heart. We can see vortex flow developing here as the blood in uh, diastole is coming in, heading for the apex. It gets to the apex and a clockwise vortex forms. And this clockwise vortex form spins the blood around through 180 degrees and straight up and out of the uh, left ventricle. You can see the vortex is pushing the anterior leaflet towards the posterior leaflet. It's pushing the anterior leaflet away from the septum. This vortex is wedged here in between the uh, septum and the anterior leaflet. Well, even my good friend Dr. Adams, who was quoted earlier, uh, still has a problem with Sam, which he's published. And uh, <laughs> I hate to have to mention that. I, he's a friend of mine, and I wouldn't want to leave you with a bad impression of anything about him, uh, but he does still have a fair bit of SAM, which is an iatrogenic complication. Uh, SAM is a real, still a real problem. Uh, it's still a common cause of failure repair. It's difficult to manage. You give inotropes, everything gets worse. Uh, it may require re-operation, and there are deaths from these problems reported in some series. 
The biggest problem, though, is this has led to a violent attack on the mitral valve leaflets with endless shaving and cutting down and trimming and transposing and sliding, and it's just not a pretty thing to talk about. <laughs> and that's, that's the big penalty, and that leads, that's one of the reasons why the failure to repair is 40%. People get enmeshed in all this stuff and get trapped. Uh, SAM actually is almost never present in unoperated patients with myxomatous degenerative or functional MR. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever referred one of these patients to a surgeon because of need to relieve SAM. I've, I've not personally seen that. And as we say, SAM is reported in some degree, and we're just, even that number earlier is, is just what's clinically significant. There's more of it than even that. Uh, the main reason we get called on to operate on SAM is in the setting of hokum, and uh, this is due to the interaction of the septal hypertroph and some abnormalities of the mitral valve. If we look at our patients undergoing implantation of a rigid ring, as recommended by Dr. Carpentier, the ring is typically seated on the D-shaped motion. The left atrial attachment ends here, so the ring is put down low and is actually mounted on part of that mitral membrane we saw going up to the aorta. So we immediately see the cause of the mitral stenosis after this procedure, but most importantly, not only do we cause mitral stenosis here with that ring put on by reduction of this dimension, but we now have limitation of motion at this point backwards and upwards, and we therefore have the anterior leaflet stranded hanging into the left ventricular outflow tract instead of being able to move out of it. So this is one of the major mechanisms of uh, SAM after use of rigid rings in the uh, mitral valve. And when we look at our vortex flow, if we look at a rigid ring or a mitral prosthesis, we see that the aortic mitral angle in these people is typically reported as being reduced to 90 degrees. So instead of the inflow being directed towards the apex in this direction, that 90 degree change directs the inflow right up against the septum. So with a rigid ring, we also have a development of a counterclockwise vortex instead of a clockwise vortex. And if we do a mitral repair with uh, a flexible ring or a, a, a partial ring, we get the more normal vortex. So vortex flow is very important to be preserved. So the mitral valve pathology in Hokum uh, 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 is that the anterior and posterior leaflets tend to be longer than usual. The anterior leaflet can be as much as one and a half times normal length. Papillary muscles are often abnormal, particularly the anterior papillary muscle, which is sometimes enlarged, and it hasn't completely developed out of the wall. So it tends to be stuck to the anterior wall, and that's pulling the anterior leaflet towards the septum because it's stuck up there. Uh, and then there are other anomalies of the posterior medial papillary muscle, muscle bands, and other odds and ends. Uh, this is what the vortex flow looks like in uh, hokum. This is the normal uh, apical clockwise flow going on here. And as we mentioned, it spins the blood out of the aorta. Here in hokum, the vortex is trying to form here, but as it comes up, it gets uh, ricocheted off the uh, hypertrope back in towards the uh, uh, zone of apposition of the mitral leaflet. And as it does this, some of the flow gets around behind here and develops a high pressure area here that displaces the zone of apposition towards the septum. And then in addition, the angle at which this comes up here and hits this edge of the leaflet leads to effectively an aerofoil-like thing where this area acts like an aircraft wing and generates lift on this side of the anterior leaflet. And that then lifts that towards the septum. And then as that gets lifted towards the septum, we get more flow on the backside here and in addition, the whole vortex gets pulled up this way, and with a clockwise vortex here, as you come up, uh, this part, uh, the, with the clockwise, if you look here, the motion is that way, so this part gets brought up here. It's, it's impinging here on the posterior surface also. So that's one of the current uh, hot theories for the genesis of hokum and uh, related uh, SAM. So here we see a patient with a big hypertroph very floppy, redundant anterior mitral leaflet. Uh, fortunately, it, we're used to dealing with floppy leaflets a lot and we never resect them, so we've never had to do anything to any of these leaflets. If you do a proper resection, which as you can see has to be very extensive to get rid of these abnormal vortices, and you take away all this hypertroph and you take it all the way down 
to below the level of the tips of the papillary muscles and you mobilize up the anterior papillary muscle to make sure it's fully mobile and it can move back and take the anterior leaflet back towards the posterior wall, you get a very good result uh, without ever having to uh, do anything to the leaflet itself, such as it patches or tear. Here's the natural state, there's the leakage, and here's the post-operative study. And so there's a very wide open left ventricular outflow tract here because of the extent of the resection and the papillary mobilization. So in my personal experience of 215 Hocum patients, we've never ever had to do anything uh, to a, a normal leaflet. We've never had to do any leaflet surgery for the Hocum. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to present with uh, other conditions such as endocarditis or ruptured cordy or uh, prolapsing leaflet and find uh, that they have hokum, which we fix at the same time. So we've done 37 patients like that. So how do we get ourselves out of this mess? Well, the first thing is not to put a rigid band across the back of the left ventricular outflow tract from the uh, right fibrous trigone to the, to the left fibrous trigone to the right fibrous trigone. What we have to do is take our ring up and around the underside of the aortic root and make sure there's plenty of redundancy in this area so that as the aorta moves back and expands, we've got enough slack there that it'll come up back into the left atrium. And when we do this, Dr. Shah uh, has done very extensive pre- and post-operative studies in these patients. What we find is post-operatively, we have complete preservation of left ventricular outflow dynamics and also the aortic mitral angles are properly preserved. So we have good documentation that this changed approach uh, produces much better results. Some years ago, we published this paper uh, comparing with uh, our distinguished guest uh, from Chicago. And we showed that the Carpentier technique uh, uh, with the rigid ring here in red and the American Correctional Dynamic Repair in black have very different results in terms of area. There are many different parameters measured in this study, but here's the Carpentier ring. No change throughout the cardiac cycle in area. That's where the mitral stenosis comes from. Whereas with the uh, dynamic approach, we have a reduction in uh, mitral annular area in systole and an expansion of the mitral annulus in diastole, which is the normal physiology of the mitral valve. We've been working with the University of Houston doing some very sophisticated studies, and uh, they have uh, been able to demonstrate that if we get a group of normals and do a sophisticated measurements using a mathematical variant of looking at torsion of, when you get a, a, a string changing shape, you can do that by measuring how much torsion it takes to make that shape change. So we look at our normals, we look at our dilated up preoperative patients with the flattened annulus, then we look at the post-op, group, they've been restored to very close to normal uh, anatomy. So just quickly running through how a repair looks, here's a huge anterior leaflet with a myxomatous valve with ruptured cordy. Put new cordy in, we never resect the leaflets. Cordy come up through the anterior leaflet here, we put little dots along the anatomical zone of apposition on these leaflets around here. We use a completely flexible ring that's adjustable. Uh, we use diastolic locking as our landmark. This is a passive phase in the cardiac cycle where the ventricle fills and before the onset of systole, the mitral leaflets are firmly opposed to each other by the passive inflation of the ventricle. So we're able to simulate that by intraoperative inflation, uh, four liters a minute. And as we do that, uh, we can simulate uh, the early systolic uh, movements without systole occurring. Here you can see the ring coming up and over. There's a definite three-dimensional component there. And you can see now as we inflate, the leaflets are coming tightly together and are going down into the ventricle. And that leads on as we inflate further into a sort of a, a early uh, isovolumic contraction phase. And here's the post-operative result. This is absolutely typical wide open LVOT, no SAM whatsoever, good zone of apposition in the cordy down here. And here, interoperative footage, it's a little hard to see, but here's the aorta back here. Here's the aortic root inflating and you can see the leaflets coming down together and you can see this expansion here of this aortic uh, root area over the left coronary, non-coronary sinus, and you can see how the anterior part of the annulus is coming over to the posterior part of the annulus. And here on the uh, 3D echo that goes along with this patient, we can see the aorta coming out here, rocking down more horizontally, left coronary sinus, 
non-coronary sinus, our annual plasty band here, and that redundancy and curvature here, allowing that root to come back and up and expand, bringing the leaflets together. <coughs> this is a different condition altogether. This is uh, Barlow's, where you've got these huge leaflets that uh, are pulling the papillary muscle up into the atrium, and here post up with a simple annual plasty ring, that's all taken care of. The leaflets are now down in the ventricle and the papillary muscles are moving down. So this is a fairly simple condition to fix. There's a four-page invited editorial we published uh, in 2015 in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular, if you're interested in more reading. Uh, results of these approaches, uh, my personal experience uh, with over 2,000 mitral repairs. Um, this is, by the way, a broader range of pathology than just leaflet prolapse. My good friend David has published a 99.9% .9 repairability <laughs> in mitral prolapse only, which is the simplest, easiest sort of kindergarten phase of, of mitral valve repair. <laughs> being in Texas, we're into sort of being a little bit manly if we can. Uh, so this is 100% repair. Uh, which we now have up to over a thousand consecutive patients. And this includes degenerative myxomas, both degenerative and myxomas, and ischemic, 100% repairability. Uh, and I'll refer you to some, a, a one hour lecture on ischemia because we have some different uh, approaches and uh, results. So we've had 100% repairability of all the conditions that have leaflets that can be repaired. When the leaflets are destroyed, it's very difficult to repair the valves. We've double checked this by going back and looking at every single uh, mitral replacement over this same period. And if you look here, we, in the earlier days when we were 80 to 90% repair, you could see little bits of pink and uh, uh, that's the myxomatous group and the degenerative group. Since 2004, there's been no patient with degenerative or myxomatous pathology or ischemic pathology that's had a mitral valve prosthesis. Freedom from reoperation is 90% at 10 years. It doesn't matter what leaflet, these techniques are universally applicable to all the different leaflets. You only need to know one operation to do every one. Uh, three to four plus mitral regurgitation is not about 85 to 90% absent. Uh, when you don't resect the leaflets, you can re-repair these valves. 80 to 90% of our reoperations uh, have been re-repairs. So we have uh, a 98.7% uh, absence of a prosthesis in these people, even with their re-repair. And now, thanks to Dr. Uh, Steve Little and Dr. Kleiman and Dr. Barker, we've had several people we've been able to rescue have, who have a problem that's been easily solved with a mitral clip. Here's a localized leak. And here the mitral clip's been put on and this patient's been saved in other operations. So this, I think, is a tremendous, uh, we, we have very few uh, people needing repairs, but the setting of a ring with cordy, mostly everything's in place, and then we can go in and do a little clip. I think it's a real good option. So what's the problem with all these failures to repair? I don't think the surgeons are stupid. Uh, I think most of our centers are pretty well equipped to do mitral repair. I just raised the question, maybe it is time to abandon this 40-year-old destructive operation and move on with all the knowledge we have to a much better option. And also people are crippling themselves who are not very good at doing the repairs because everyone thinks it's a great idea to walk out of the hospital with a seven or eight centimeter thoracotomy instead of a sternotomy, but with a leaky valve that needs to be re-replaced at some future time. Mini now means a little stick in the groin. Uh, have a website with videos uh, of these operations. And then on YouTube, there's a Grand Rounds one hour version of this lecture, general lecture, and we've got one full hour lecture on the topic of ischemic mitral repair. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity.